Life Stories Live. Been sitting there usually early in the morning and I had a phone call from the United States, from Dallas. And this evangelist was speaking to me and he said, Trevor, you need to come to America. You need to come to Dallas in three weeks to the National Religious Broadcasters Conference. And I thought, well, I can't afford that sort of thing. I haven't got the money to pay for a trip to the States. Anyway, my wife got up in the morning, you know, early, and she poked her head in the door and I said, I think I need to go to America. And she says, well, God's will, his bill, sort of thing. And I thought, okay. Anyway, um, I invited a friend to come with me and he was considering. And then after a week or so, he came to me and said, look, I'll pay for everything for you to go. Um, and that was um, that was a real blessing. And uh, so within three weeks, I was in, in Dallas. I arrived in Dallas uh, to go to this national broadcast, uh, religious broadcasters conference, obviously because of the involvement with TV and television ministry international that I was involved in. And whilst I was in Dallas, I was so jet lagged. I'd never traveled so far. And, you know, um, Honolulu and Perth are considered the most isolated cities in the world. And I travel from one of the most isolated cities in the world to LA, to Sydney, to LA and to Dallas. And I tell you, I was absolutely worn out. I was tired. I was jet lagged. I could hardly stay awake. My sleep patterns were all over the place. I'd never have experienced anything like that in my life. So I um, sat on my bed one night. And funnily enough, the, the, the room I was staying in in a hotel, the lights was quite dull. They weren't bright. And I couldn't understand that. But I sat in this dull light and I said, God, whatever am I doing here? I'm not happy. And then he started to show me a vision like in pictures. And um, I'll just briefly tell you what it was. It was a river and the source coming down the mountain to a nice flowing river. And, you know, that was just a, a, sort of like my life. You, you've come tumbling down the source. You've been steady for many years, just walking with God and serving as he's called me. And then there's a rapid. And, you know, uh, and, I'm, and it's like he, God said, but you're in there now, the rapid. You're being beaten up. You're being tumbled up, uh, tumbled and pushed around. And, you know, just prior to that, a, um, a gentleman, a preacher came and he grabbed me aside and he said, you've been pulled apart. Like I can see the arms like a the gollywog because your arms have been pulled off and your eyes have been pulled out. And, you know, and it was a time, it was a most unsettling time spiritually and in many ways uh, there was obviously some sort of change on the way. And um, so I sat there and, and then after the rapids, there was a little waterfall and then the water was running smooth again. And um, I said to the Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? And the words that came to mind was, you need to, res you need to resign from your leadership in that church. In, 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 a, in a nutshell, he said, you may need to stop what you're doing. And I thought, well, if I stop what I'm doing there, and I've been the leader for 12 years, then I should go somewhere else, do another fellowship, get out of the way. Um, but then I had another vision. And, you know, I mean, visions are uh, sometimes difficult to understand initially. And it, it was a bottle of blue ink with a corner of a piece of blotting paper in it. And I just went, I mean, I shook my head and said, Holy Spirit, whatever you're trying to say here. And he said, I want you to stay where you are. Now, as, as the years have gone by, um, that bottle of ink and the blotting paper just with a corner in the ink, was actually, and I would say this way now today, that it was the Lord showing me that I want you to stay there because that's where I will prepare you for what I want you to do. And so I stayed at that church. We stayed there for approximately another five years. And that was all in February 2001, all that happened. <clears throat> of course, at the end of all of that, I said, well, Lord, what's next? And he says, I, I didn't get an answer to that. It was just, trust me. So I went back home to Perth and continued. Oh, I resigned the very day I arrived back in Perth from the church leadership team, stayed in that church. 
And then in um, uh, in 2001, in that year, there was a gentleman in Durban, South Africa, laying on his bed, and he had a migraine. And the Lord said to him, I want you to go to Australia. I've got a job for you to do. And um, so he um, followed that up with prayer. And he, I know he came here in 2002 and did some ministry. And uh, that didn't work out so well. It was uh, a little bit messy for him. Anyway, in 2002, in the middle of in July, I received a phone call from a um, friend of mine. He said, would you like to go to have a look at this governor's prayer breakfast um, uh, organization and meeting? And, and I, I had heard about it. I had never been to anything like that. So I went along to this meeting this Sunday afternoon. Now, I don't ever remember being appointed or voted onto a committee, but I ended up on there somehow. And I ended up with an assignment. And the assignment was to organize the appointed keynote speaker for 2003. So off I went uh, to work out how to do this. I'd never, ever done anything like it. I didn't know what to do. So I prayed about it, obviously. And <clears throat> I managed to get hold of this particular person's personal assistant in Sydney. And I asked her if she could let the CEO of this large organisation know that he was invited to be the keynote speaker at the 2003 Governor's Pre-Breakfast in Perth in Western Australia. Anyway, uh, that was late 2002, February 2003, I received a message to say that he was unable to come. Now, in the meantime, my wife and the producer of our television ministry was saying he's not the right person. He's not the right person for that. And I said, well, I've, I've only been asked to do it. I haven't done any of the selection. So when he was unable to come, I went to my uh, friend, Bruce, who was running the television, and I said, Bruce, what? this guy can't come. I don't know what to do. He said, Trev, just go and pray for a few days and just wait on God and see what happens. My wife, uh, same thing. She was saying to me, that's not the right person. So this was on a Thursday, and um, February 2003, and of course, organising international and interstate speakers, you need quite a bit of lead time. So we're getting a bit short on time because this whole thing is going to happen in the middle of the year. And um, so I just spent Thursday and Friday and Saturday just seeking God. And I woke up Sunday morning as I, as I was waking, um, just before I was fully awake, a name came into my mind. And uh, so I had a friend of mine many years ago said, when, when you had some thoughts early in the morning, it could be God giving you an instruction or asking you to do something. 
just um, ponder it for a while and just make an assessment and see whether you think it is God speaking. I felt it was. So I said to my wife at breakfast that day, I said, you know, Peter Pollock, I think, is the guy that God wants at the breakfast next uh, in, in, in um, it's actually September it was that year. So I said, and she said, absolutely, that's the man. So I went down to the television office later in the day and I said to Bruce, you know, Peter Pollock is a guy that's come to mind. And he said, yeah, he's the man. He's the one to, um, to speak at the breakfast. I said, well, I don't know. I know he lives in South Africa. I've only ever seen him playing international cricket. As some of you may know, he was the fastest bowler in the world in his day in the 60s and so forth. And uh, God got a hold of him when he was about 40. Uh, anyway, um, so my friend, my, the producer of the television, Bruce, said, look, I have a mutual friend. So he made a phone call that Monday morning and um, they contacted Peter and Peter said that I was scheduled to be in Australia in, the, in that three weeks. Um, and in the middle of that three weeks was this breakfast. He had cancelled coming for, because nothing had been organised. However, as soon as he got this invitation, he reinstated those three weeks and um, he came and uh, did the breakfast and we did many other things in those three weeks. Once again, I ended up being the facilitator of those whole three weeks and we did 25 meetings in three weeks in and around Perth in Western Australia. And we never spoke about actually continuing to do these things or anything like that. But um, 25 year, uh, 20 years has passed. Uh, we've traveled to all parts of Australia. Um, and my job was to fil facilitate and manage the ministry of this evangelist, a man who, um, for those who don't know him, who would, uh, God would use to speak to 50,000, 60,000 in a stadium, but the humility of the man was that he would speak to five people as just as fervently and uh, with as much passion as he would speak to 50,000 people. I remember I said to him, I said, how many people do you expect? Some guys you work with, they say they want 500, 600 before they'll come or they want a lot of money. So I asked the question and the question was, how many people? He says, five to 50,000, doesn't, that doesn't matter. And then I said, money, he said, don't talk to me about that. I live by faith. It's I sort of, he didn't say this, but I realized it was my problem, not his, to sort out the finances. So there we go. We, we did the breakfast um, and then we did that three weeks. And since then we've traveled, as I said, all around Australia. Um, I'd just like to just share one little story about a speaker who I um, was organizing to come and do the breakfast. He was one of your... Um, members of parliament in England, uh, Lord Bob Edmiston, he ended up being. Anyway, uh, a mutual friend said, you need to get Bob to come and speak at this breakfast. And, he, and I said, yeah, okay. So I checked it all out and it all checked out. The credentials were good. Prayed about it. God said, yep, go ahead. And so I invited him to come. At this time, I wasn't the chairman of the breakfast. It was many years ago. Anyway, um, when I got to the um, committee meeting to to announce that Bob Edmiston had been invited, the chairman said, he's not the speaker. I've invited somebody else. And I thought, oh dear, what do I do about this? Anyway, I decided to wait three weeks to, uh, before I told Bob that he wasn't coming. And, he, and about just before the three weeks was up, my, my phone goes one afternoon and it's Bob Edmiston. He says, Trevor, I just wanted to ring and let you know, look, I've been considered for the House of Lords Therefore, I don't think it's a good idea to come and do the governor's prayer breakfast, um, which is a vice regal um, um, meeting. But uh, so I, I'm, I won't be able to come. And of course, I was quite relieved that I didn't have to uh, ring up and tell him God had taken care of it. Um, Bob never knew about that. He, may, he probably might, might know about it now that he's heard, if he hears this, but uh, I never told him that he, uh, that he wasn't the speaker. And that's just one. And there's many stories. I've had the privilege to invite um, 19 to 20 people from around the world to speak at this meeting um, each year. And in this year, in August, we'll be celebrating 30 years of Governor's Prayer Breakfast. Humble beginnings of 30, 40 people, 
to now uh, 1,000 to 1,500 um, come to the meeting and we, we pray we, um, and we have a speaker to share about their life and uh, what, what Jesus did for them. So that was how that all happened. And um, I'd just like to finish off just with a couple of little interesting stories. They're quite small in, and, and maybe some would say insignificant, but one money story, and there's many. We travelled from Perth to Sydney and then uh, a little way by car to another city, another town in New South Wales, and to minister at a Baptist church for the weekend. And... Um, we never demanded anything. We never spoke about fees. People would ask what about money, and if they asked me, I would tell them. But I got to this place, having not said anything about money and cost and so forth, and I got this uh, it's 150 Australian dollars handed to me, and my heart sank, and I thought it cost us far more than that to get over here. Anyway, the next day, the person who was looking after me, where I stayed at his house, he came to me and he said, um, here's a gift for the ministry. It was a substantial amount of money. And as you would understand, like God said to me, don't you worry about the source of funds. You just trust me. So that was one little thing. Um, <clears throat> another story just in the domestic side of my life was um, we, we had a house in uh, that we'd been living in for approximately 20 years. The children had been born by this time and they were in high school. And uh, anyway, I, we, we thought we needed to move to another house. And my wife was quite keen to move. And I thought, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a hard, I'm a hard guy to shift at times. And anyway, I found a place in the next suburb and we I went into it. And uh, my wife came and had a look at it after. And we, um, as we walked through the door, this guy just said to me, oh, he dropped the whole price by $5,000, just like that. stories live anyway we we looked at it we thought it was a good idea my wife came and said to me what do you think i said we can't afford to buy that house we just don't have the funds we won't be able to get the money one tuesday this was in november it was back in 1999 i was on the train coming home from work and this voice spoke to me again that i was familiar with and it said if that person rings you you have to buy that house so I arrived home that evening. I was home for about 45 minutes and the phone rang and this guy said, do you want to, are you going to buy this house? My wife will tell you, I went white and I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I had to buy that house. So um, everything, we put everything in place to sell our house and buy that house. And um, my wife informed me at some stage during this process that when she stepped into that house that day to have a look at it, that she felt God said to her, this is your house. Now, there's many more things, uh, difficulties attached to that that I haven't got time to go into, but uh, that was, uh, we lived there for 14 years. It was close to the girls' school and everything was 
It was a lovely place. We've moved now to another place, but uh, that was where we lived for a while. And one of the very interesting story, Peter and I were walking through Brisbane Airport on our way to travel for most of the day to a place called Shepparton in Victoria, which was a long way south. And as I was walking to the plane or to the, to the lounge, uh, this sort of a prayer came out of my mouth, I just whispered, and I said, Lord, I need a toothbrush. Now, I had a toothbrush, and I couldn't work out why did I pray that prayer. Um, maybe my toothbrush was too shabby. I don't know. You know, we travelled most of the day, and we arrived at this place called Shepherd and checked Peter into his hotel, and as often it was, I would go and stay with somebody in town. So I went and stayed with this couple, and often you'd go into the room where they'd set aside for you, and there would be a, a, a bath towel and maybe some soap or something like that. But when I walked into that room that day, there was a toothbrush, a brand new toothbrush sitting on the bed. And I said to this lady, she was a disabled lady, I said, why did you put that toothbrush on the bed? She said, God told me to. I tell you, it's only a little thing, but it's it just, God is so interested in us personally, corporately, and as people often say, he wants everything from us. He owns all things. And, you know, you have a house, you have this, you have that, but we just have to say, Lord, use me and what I have, what you've given me, to be a testimony and a witness for Jesus. And um, so that's sort of a, a fairly um, short version of my story. A lot of friends will say to me, when do you stop telling stories, Trevor? Well, God's given me so many and um, and it's an absolute. It, it, it brings me to tears often when I sit in church and reflect or even at home in my prayer, prayer time and reflect upon how God used me. And, you know, in about the first probably year of being born again, saved, uh, a gentleman came to me in this church and said, you are a facilitator. I didn't have a clue really what that word meant. But today I can tell you that God has used and, and um, given me the gifts and abilities to be a facilitator. And uh, as time goes by, the facilitation role does grow bigger. And even this opening and on um, life stories is another chapter that I'm sure we'll see um, God use this and maybe um, Alan and myself and the others to reach out to people because each and every one of us, our stories will minister to a different cohort, different group of people, whether they be businessmen or people who have been going to church for years but haven't encountered the Lord Jesus Christ or just a simple guy on the street or a drug addict, whatever. Um, God is interested in all of them and he wants to save them. His desire is that none should perish. And so I encourage in my life, I, th I often think, and I per see a person, I say, I don't know how God will ever save that person. And then I have to remember that he saved me and that if he can save me, he can save anybody. <laughs> So let me just finish with a final scripture. It's from Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day that Jesus returns. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you for sharing your story, your life, and how God has guided you all through since you gave your life to him, how he's been with you and shown you the step of the way. And that's the wonderful thing about God. God does guide us. If we trust him, he has a plan. He has a plan for your life. Everyone is watching tonight. God has a plan for your life. But the important, most important thing is that you need to know him. It's when you get to know him, then he can show you what he has for your life. And so the most important thing is to give your life to him. You know, Trevor just said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to, to repent, all would come to know him. Mm -hmm. And that's what you can do tonight. You can come to know the one who to know his life eternal. And one thing Trevor said tonight, and it hit me, two words was, why wait? That's what God said to you, why wait? And you know, the Bible says today is a day of salvation. So you don't know what tomorrow will bring. It's just like your life is just like a vapor. It's here for one moment and then gone. Just like a mm. puff of smoke. 
But tonight, God is speaking to you tonight. God is speaking to you. You're watching tonight. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to have that experience of eternal life and have that peace which only he can give. What do you have to do to have that? Well, Jesus said, the Bible says, we're, we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And that's why Jesus came. He came from heaven. He took on the form of man. And he, he went to that cross and died in your place to pay the punishment for your sins, pay the penalty for your sins. And then he rose again from the dead. And what we have to do, Jesus said, repent and believe. Repent means turning away from your old ways, your whole life, and then asking Jesus to come into your heart and life. And if you do that, he will come in. He will give you the free gift of eternal life. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You have to receive it like any gift. And so what I'm going to do is lead you in a little prayer. And if you are sincere, I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. And you can know this same Jesus that's guided Trevor through his life. So pray this prayer with me now. Mean it with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I confess that I am a sinner. Because the Bible says we have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And that includes me. But I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross in my place, taking the punishment for my sins. And you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. I turn to you with all my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life right now by your spirit. And give to me the free gift of eternal life. Mm. I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. Now I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God has raised him from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me, for making me a child of God. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life and then look forward to that day when I will be with you in heaven forever. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, please let us know. Contact us on our hotline, plus 44-794-355-0287. I'll go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. There you will find um, a prayer link. You can click on that salvation prayer link. You can also get um, information about how can I get to know God and also a Bible app, which will help you to uh, know more about this wonderful God. I'm going to hand over to George now. I believe he asked some questions for Trevor. Thank you, George. Life Stories Live.